Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the early morning edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 7th of June, 2018. Good morning, Gavin. How are things over in London? Good morning, Kevin. Well, I'm I'm in Shropshire, but uh, the okay. things in Shropshire are extremely nice. <laughs> Though I haven't had my morning coffee yet because my uh, uh, the kitchen is occupied with domestic activity, and I I don't I, don't go the, don't go there. <laughs> the, the family are on on the phone, and I don't launch the kettle. So I'm I'm sitting here looking at your coffee with some admiration, which is really I'm good envy. this morning because I we had I had to get up early to tape with you. You're off to get the car fixed today. Oh yes, um, it's 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 one of those disasters. Um, uh, we we try we're building a greenhouse. We try to put a a piece of pipe into the car, and the the back of the car pressed it against the windscreen, and the even as a plastic pipe, and the windscreen shattered from the inside. Uh, um, it's, the last time I so went to get a wind a windscreen replaced in my car, uh, I had a person working on my roof, and he dropped his. Uh, uh, power drill and just slid all the way down and cracked my windscreen. I go in to the shop and there's another car next to mine that had two big rubber boots through the windscreen that were, oh, you know, the person oh, wasn't in them, but you could tell he had slid off the roof and landed in his car. <laughs> he just, I well, like the I, stories I, these guys must uh, listen to at the windscreen uh, repair, repair well, shop. Well, uh, Ours is more complicated because we have something called the MOT, which is a, an annual check on your car. Uh -huh. And if you don't pass it, you can't drive it. And as it so happens, the annual MOT check is the, is tomorrow. Uh -huh. So the windscreen has to be fixed today. But the nearest windscreen place is, is over an hour and a half's drive away. And they've been trying to cancel, saying, we don't have the windscreen. You can't have it. So we don't have the windscreen. We can't. From tomorrow, we can't drive the car. <laughs> so we'd be saying, but you said you had the windscreen. And uh, so we were a bit of prayer and some fairly straight talking, and they now say they have it. Good. So it's all okay, but it's a bit tense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's tension now in the church, and I thought this is a great time for a transition. Um, we all remember the early days of Pope Francis. Uh, he would travel to a, a new nation in his little plane, and he'd give a press conference uh, to the press in the back of his plane. And the, the whole time, at least the next week, week and a half, the uh, Roman uh, people who defend him, he said, well, he didn't really mean that. He didn't say that. That's not what he meant. Of course, homosexuality uh, you know, is, a, is a sin, whatever he had said. And we also have a little bit of that in Archbishop Justin Welby. Uh, he recently uh, was traveling outside the country and he gave a little talk and his offhand remarks were that um, the European Union is the greatest thing, not since sliced bread, but since the Western uh, Roman Empire. Now, okay, ex except, Kevin, yeah. they weren't offhand remarks. They're in the script, <laughs> They're in the script. as the second paragraph to the end, well, uh, the culmination I, of the speech. I heard a rumor now that he's denying that, but we'll, we'll get to that in, in, in a second. Um, you went to school. You know the history of the Western Roman Church. It was a bit chaotic. Western Roman Empire. It was a bit chaotic. Well, if I was defending, let me try and defend Justin okay, for, for a moment, right. because we should speak the truth in love. And uh, I think I understand what he was trying to do. What I'm surprised at is that it was done so unwell. <laughs> So here, here he is speaking to a very wide group of European churches at a, at a, a European synod. Uh, and clearly he wants to say positive things about Europe. Uh, and he says some, he, 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 he mixes in his, in his address a number of things, some of which are lovely and Christian and wholesome, all the virtues of the Holy Spirit, uh, trust, humility, kindness, love, of course. Mm -hmm. But he slips in one or two, one, he slips in two difficult things. And the reason they matter is because they become the way of mixing politics and faith. Now, if I have a bishop stand up and he wants to preach to me about what Jesus said and what St. Paul said and what the Holy Spirit says, this is fine. This is the work of a bishop. If I have a bishop or an archbishop stand up and says, I want you to support the government because the government's political policies uh, are, are very close to the heart of Jesus, 
then he better be right, <laughs> or else, or or else he's doing several problematic things. One is he's not telling the truth, and the other thing is he's dividing the church. Now, what Justin Welby did was was the latter, effectively, because he said this: the EU has been the greatest dream realized for human beings since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It has brought peace, prosperity, compassion for the poor and the weak, purpose for, for the aspirational, and help for all its people. Now the problem is that that we are in a in 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 the UK we're in a very difficult moment as we are preparing to leave the European Union, and the country is completely divided. It's not just divided; it's deaf. One side can't hear the other, and they get very angry with each other. Uh, and at this point, the Archbishop chooses to make a remark about the EU that has two aspects to it. One is it, it's factually completely incorrect. And the other is it becomes a matter of considerable division. Because in speaking like this, uh, he doesn't stop being the Archbishop of Canterbury just because he's in Serbia. Brexit doesn't stop happening because he's meeting a, a, a Council of European Churches. And so, of course, the, the papers in this country um, erupted in, in concern, uh, effectively saying you've made a serious misjudgment of history and you've misused your office. Why would you do this? Now, there's, a, there's another problem, which we'll come to later on, and that is that um, a, a friend of mine sent me a, a piece of paper, paper this morning saying from a, a house church leader, Maybe I won't give his name because I've that, written to him don't, asking. Yeah, don't don't give his name yet. I've written to him asking him uh, if what he said is true, mm. and he hasn't got back to me yet. But but he 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 says this: we were invited. We, we Justin Welby supporters were invited to Lambeth Palace last night. Warm sunshine, manicured gardens, plenty of good food and drink. An excellent talk from Bishop Justin on his three main priorities. Oh, when they're good ones, Kevin: prayer, reconciliation, and evangelism. Perfect. Great global yeah. great global stories of of this work. He talked of church planting, face to face, sensitive but purposeful evangelism. This is wonderful. Uh, he stopped and we said, "Oh, look, we have." And then the author himself here. Um, so the author's pleased about that. Um, and then and then uh, he explained that he never said, reported in the press today, that the European Union is the greatest dream realized for human beings since the fall of the Western Empire. He explained what he said, that what he said to hundreds of church leaders was we should be grateful that the EU has been a major factor in keeping Europe free from war and national conflict. Now, the thing is, if he'd never said it, Kevin, his press office would be all over those who wrote about it saying, you've misquoted him. Yeah. So we have a problem here. The press office haven't said he's never said it. But here we have a very well-liked, well-respected, well-loved leader saying that Justin Welby said he never said it. Now, I, I don't know what to make of that. I, I don't either. And hopefully today Lambeth uh, Press will you know, certainly clear this up for us. Um, because if you look at the whole of it, the Western Roman Empire was a mess. The European Union is in many ways like that. Um, but if you think of uh, Justin Welby's pet projects over the last you know, five years, payday you know lending um all these little things uh the european union is the biggest payday lender there is ask squeeze you know kevin uh, i i i should make a disclaimer that, yeah. that, that, that I, I, i'm a europhile i love europe uh, i have a small shack in europe <laughs> i speak quite good french i speak poor german i sing lamentable italian i love europe sure. i'm a european <laughs> i happen to think that the, that the European Union as a political project is a very dangerous thing for a number of Christian reasons. I, I was shocked when uh, Gistard Destin, the, the French Prime Minister in 2005, put, a, put a, a constitution together for the European Union, which deliberately wiped out the whole of Christianity. Uh -huh. And I suspected at that moment that the EU was not a Christian-friendly organization, and indeed it hasn't proved to be. My biggest problem with it, apart from that, it's never audited its accounts. Is is that it is wholly anti-democratic. There is no, there are no democratic levers effective to make the leaders accountable for it. Mm -hmm. Now, I I was asked by a, a newspaper to write a comment. One of the things I said was that it's perfectly true that without the European Union, European nationalism uh, for over three hundred years uh, led to the ghastly First and Second World Wars. But the problem is. That that's not the only cause of bloodshed. The other cause of bloodshed has been the great Marxist empires, 
which are examples of, of places with democratic deficit. And they've also led to the most disastrous wars and, and a lot of human life. In other words, but, but now you see, we would know this. This is sin. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you look to the left or the right or the center for political projects. Sin is sin is sin. And my difficulty with an archbishop presenting a political program as a, as a mechanism of salvation is that they aren't. So, so A, he's made a serious mistake in principle uh, because he shouldn't present a political program as a means of, of, of salvation, uh, either temporal or spiritual. Mm -hmm. B, he's wrong factually. And C, and here's the big thing, this, this makes me quite, quite energized. <laughs> uh, his whole, he, he, has, he has sold himself to us as an agent of reconciliation. How can he, what, what, what he's just done is to divide the country again into pro and anti-Brexit by making these remarks in the public space. So this was, this was I guess this was carelessness. To defend him, as I wanted to do in the beginning, I can see, I can see that by going into a European forum, you'd want to say some pro-European things, but you'd have to be very careful about how you did it, and he doesn't seem to be very careful. I do remember some of the discussions uh, in the, the House of Bishops uh, before where he was a bully. He said, vote my way, basically with women's uh, bishops and other things. Um, if you don't vote the way I vote, you're doing it wrong. And, you know, just remembering some of these, now I'm, I'm kind of seeing this come out in his European U Union discussions. Um, he ha he ha I don't want to be personal. He hasn't mm -hmm. bullied me. Uh, I, I have seen him treat people badly, but then I dare say people have seen me treat people badly too on a bad day. Uh, but I think I have difficulties here with the issue of integrity. Mm -hmm. If he really has said to a group of people, I didn't say this when he did, uh, then, then you know, that's enormously problematic. I have difficulty with, with any archbishop, let alone one who stands for reconciliation, dividing the country politically when it's so very badly divided already. And as I've already said a number of times, I have difficulty with the fact that I think he's brought entirely into the zeitgeist over the whole sexual identity idea, which for me makes him uh, a really problematic Christian leader because uh, I see him as, as teaching bad theology and bad spirituality and now bad politics. Um, and you know, ah, what, what can you do? Pray for him, I suppose. Yes. But, but also, but, but also and, and this is what I try to do in my article, hold him accountable in a way that isn't mean. Because <laughs> the moment we get mean, and, um, and, and you know, and God forgive me if I'm mean, I'm trying hard not to be, <laughs> trying to restrain it. But, but on the other hand, in, in public, we Christian public figures have to hold each other accountable, A, for, for, for telling the truth, and for keeping faith with the gospel. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 404 of Anglican Unscripted. I told you to write it down. Oh, 403. It's all right. Oh, I, I wrote it down because Kevin, it's so early I, in the morning, I, I, you know. Never, <laughs> you misheard me. I didn't, I didn't. I never said. No, I didn't hear you say it either. I'm here to defend you. Kevin, I apologize. I got it wrong. I made a stupid mistake. <laughs> it was 403. <laughs> 404 is coming later. That's right. <laughs> Cheers, my friend. Get your car fixed, and I'll catch you later. <laughs> God bless, Kevin. God bye bless. Bye.